Uh, this is our final, final event of Skolnik 2019. Uh, I'm thrilled that Nancy Harrell has been able to make it over to us from Boston, where she lives. Uh, I think most of us heard her really excellent talk in Medieval Mile Museum yesterday evening. And so today we have the, the great pleasure of launching her new book here at the festival. Um, Nancy, of course, is an advisor to uh, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, uh, but she's a multi-talent, she's a harpist as well. Modern harpist plays early harps and now turned scholar and has spent 10 years of her life researching John Egan and his beautiful harps. And so now we get to the fruition of all that hard work and we have her beautiful book. So if you haven't got a copy, I strongly recommend that you do because it's a classic. There's, there's, nothing is going to replace this for the next hundred years and you want to have this on your shelves as a reference work. It's going to be, it, it is now the main reference work for John Egan's harp. So if you're interested in harp history at all, this is the book for you. Uh, I think Nancy also has some CDs where she's playing her Egan harp. So if you want to hear the sound of the harp of the harps that she's talking about, maybe consider having a, a sound recording as well. So it is with great pleasure uh, that I give you uh, that I give you Nancy. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be back at school. Uh, I was here in 2015, and I, I have to say this is the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. And I've done some pretty difficult things, because I'm one of those harpists. I play all kinds of early harps where there's not actually a harp part. I'm given the vocal score, and I have to create harp parts for concerts where people buy tickets. But writing a book, researching this for years and years, not knowing that if anything would ever come of it, but I just kept going. And when I was here in 2015, and you, you welcomed me, and many of you said, you know, this is a good story, thank you for doing this, and it's helped me keep going over the finish line, and I'm just thrilled to bits. I got my first choice publisher, Four Chords Peck Press, and they've just done a beautiful production with the books. The, the paper is so nice and, you know, I mean, I can go on and on with everything. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just over the moon um, that it's now in print. And um, I'm an author now. <laughs> It's, so, it's like running a marathon. That last year with edits, uh, like every two weeks, mm -hmm. proofs, so much. I was just saying, so, there's so much detail. And why did I pick this? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, measurements, footnotes, and things move around when the publisher gives you the next proof. Um, that All the illustrations, getting, I had to get hold of those illustrations from all museums all over the world. Uh, some of those I had, you know, used my own money. Uh, so play another wedding, you know, buy another <laughs> image. <laughs> but um, anyway, did, did you have a question? No, I was just going to tell that that explains that bottle of whiskey called Writer's Tears that I saw. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's a good feeling. It's a really good feeling. All right, so this is just a brief um, introduction to sort of what the book is about and, and what this is about, uh, how Egan relates to Skoll with his wire-strung harps. So, what is an Irish harp? Well, of course this is an Irish harp, isn't it? The Brian Brew harp, the Trinity College harp, is the symbol of Ireland. Yes, we, of course that's an Irish harp. And of course this is an Irish harp. This is the Bunworth harp at our Boston Museum. Well, okay, why are they are Irish? Well, they, they have wire strings, of course. The sound boxes are carved out of a log of wood. Yeah, we know these are Irish harps. Okay, so is this an Irish harp? Well, it's kind of looks like the Brian Beru, it's the same size. Um, it, but, but wait a minute, the sound box is, is different. It's made of built-up construction. It's not hollowed out of a log. Wait a minute, the strings are different. It 
has gut strings, not wire strings. Well, what about this harp? This, well, these two, last two harps, of course, are by Irish harp maker John Egan, and the one on the left, uh, a Grecian harp, but it's by an Irish harp maker, and he <coughs> advertised it as an Irish harp, so maybe it is, but, but then we look at this one. Is this an Irish harp? It has wire strings. It's not, doesn't have a carved sound box. This, this is so confusing, isn't it? And here at Skull, we have terminology for all the different harps, don't we? This is what we talk about in these wonderful uh, master classes that we have here. Um, but for most of the world, are, are people who read about harps, it's a very complicated subject. You know, what is the Irish harp? And as Karen said um, a couple of days ago, people tend to lump things into one, this is an Irish harp. Particularly the harps of John Egan, tend, it's, oh, this is an Egan harp. But no, he made many, many different types of harps. And so over the years, I noticed so much confusion concerning John Egan harps in scholarly articles, really. And uh, all these printed sources, and I'm reading this, I'm like, no, 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 that's not, that's not the right harp you're talking about. And so I felt there was a need for this volume to um, distinguish between the different Egan models and then distinguish his harps from the ancient Irish harp, the harp that we study here at School of Clarsha. Um, some of the uh, things I've read, did you know that Egan harps were played at the Belfast Harp Festival? Oh. No, 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 no. Did you know that the rebel patriot Robert Emmett played an Egan harp? <laughs> of course, um, they weren't, hadn't been invented, the poor large hadn't been invented, but I read that, you know. Um, but these myths and legends seem to go hand in hand with harp history, don't they? I mean, even the Brian Beru legend. Um, now, I saw so recently a, sculpt, a, a beautiful sculpture portrait of Caroline playing an Egan Port of Port. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Perfect example. The, does it, that could be the subject of a scholarly article. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so my book, The Egan Irish Harps, focuses on how and why this Irish harp underwent a change around 1800. And as I said last night, it's important to understand that musical instruments are not evolutionary in the same sense as plants and animals, that the changes in these instrument designs are driven by fashion and cultural tastes. This, I belong in many harp camps, and it's always, oh, our harp is better than your harp. No, it's just different, isn't it? And I felt there was a need to just tell the story of the history, not to be subjective about, oh, this one's moved on and evolved from this one. No, it wasn't really like that. So, as I mentioned last night, John Egan was not a typical heart maker at all. He was an inventor. He, he made so many different types of harps. The little, small harps like this, um, crazy, you know, this one has this uh, brass pillar and the rods go inside the sound box. And they're just lots of different mechanisms, sizes, as we know, wire strung, gut strung, all different shapes. Um, and so I was really attracted to this <coughs> art maker. Um, and he was an inventor, and I love it that he signed his harps for a time as J. Egan Inventor. <laughs> so my book presents these different harps, and I've tried to make it, I want this harp to be readable. Um, one of, you know, I've had 
This journey started way back in 2002, and I've, wa I've wanted to give up so many times along the way, and always something happened, like an Egan Harp was found in a skip in New York, and, then, and I was interviewed, you know, something, whenever I was like, well, I can't do this, something else would happen, and one of the things was giving a lecture at the Royal Irish Academy in 2008 um, on Thomas More's Egan Harp, and people lined up after the lecture for two hours, telling me their stories of, uh, of harps, their ancestors, who great, great auntie Mary played the harp, and oh, I think there's an Egan in this monastery, you know, and I was writing it all down, and I thought, I have to do this, I have to do this, but I wanted to write the book where it's readable, where it's stories, not just of the harps, but of the players and the music they play. Because you can't um, divide the, in well you could, but nobody, you know, I want it to be read, right? It's, it's all the, about the culture, the harpists, the music, the period. But at this festival of the, the early Irish harp, and I know I've gone over already, um, we want to talk about the wire-strung instruments uh, made for the Irish Harp Societies of Dublin and Belfast. And these harps, um, the only surviving ones, were from the Belfast uh, Harp Society schools from 1819 to 1839. And we see um, they're in this high-headed shape and a conical sound box. The bottom is open. Um, and they are wire-strung instruments. The design intent was a freestanding wire-strung that was lightweight and portable. And we learn about the design concept from these um, rules that still survive of the Dublin Irish Harp Society um, in 1810. And they say that, they specifically say, it is not essential to its character that it should remain as it now is, but may further be improved, either in its size, shape, or the number and quality of its strings, consistently with the origin and principles of the instrument. And then, as you know, um, when a pupil graduated from the school, he was given one of these instruments and to support himself and to tour. So, it, so harps, it says, shall be made for that purpose, provided always they be cheap and portable. So the goal was not replicas as our goal is today, isn't it? No, the, the goal was, in this improving age, was to make lightweight, portable, wire-strung instruments so that these students could go out into the country and keep this music going because it was more the focus was not really on the organology of the instrument. It was more on the music, um, passing down these tunes that were collected oral by Bunting and passed on orally. Only six of these harps have come to light so far, and they're fairly consistent um, in all of their measurements. The, some of the discrepancies in measurements can be explained really by restorations, you know, like a stand was added at the bottom or the sides. But the main difference uh, among them is really in the decoration. And the most highly decorated is this one in the National Museum in Collins Barracks. And I'm really excited because we were talking about this here in 2015 and what could these symbols possibly mean. And since then, I'm so happy to tell you that I had a breakthrough. And we see on the soundboard here these antique crowns for Irish independence and Gaelic inscriptions uh, referring to the sweet music of Ireland. And then on the lower left, we see uh, the Red Hand of Ireland, which is the official seal of the O'Neill family. And then on the lower right, is the badge of the Order of St. Patrick. Can you see this somewhat? Yeah, it's suddenly the sun came out. Um, but this, the badge of the Order of St. Patrick 
uh, was this prestigious order of chivalry that was set up by George III in 1783. Uh, th this was the first meeting of these knights um, of, of the Order of St. Patrick. You, you can, if you go to Dublin Castle, you can see the medals they wore, you know, and they dressed in these sort of medieval uh, garb as knights. But it was very prestigious uh, to be uh, given this award. Well, um, evidence suggests that this harp was played uh, by a harper whose patron was Charles O'Neill, the first <coughs> Earl O'Neill, the Lord of Shane's Castle in 1821. And he was the only O'Neill to attain this order of St. Patrick. So it was him. And this harp, you know, the dates line up everything the red hand of the O'Neills. Um, it makes perfect sense. And this harp was most certainly played at the state banquet for George IV during his historic visit to Ireland in 1821. We know that there were these wire-strung harps played at the banquet. And in Hubert Burke's Ireland 60 Years Ago, the author states that two of the harpers at the banquet were sent by the Lord of Shane's Castle, Charles O'Neill. It's really exciting when I came across that. And they were dressed in the ancient costume of the O'Neills. <laughs> oh, to be a fly on the wall. So another society harp of historical significance is this one, number 1933, which is also in the National Museum, it was owned by Robert Bruce Armstrong, who's pictured here playing the harp, in his landmark 1904 volume, Musical Instruments. And um, he writes in the book, um, upon the right hand side of the sounding board are deeply scratched letters and marks indicating the notes to which the strings were tuned, perhaps to be fingered by a blind boy as an early lesson, while the fingers of his left hand pulled the strings. And you can still see these scratch marks on the soundboard today. I mean, we don't know when that might have been, but um, you know, that's what Armstrong thought and makes, makes a lot of sense. Then the most legendary player, of course, Patrick Byrne, who toured for over 40 years playing his, his Egan harp and was a favorite of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert playing at Buckingham Palace. And in 1845, um, you know, this wonderful image uh, posing as the last minstrel striking the harp and is in a sort of bardic dress improvised from a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> and remarkably, there was this harp in Ohio for a time that it is believed to be his harp. It's, it's very, very possible that it was. Uh, it matches up in every way and it has these splendid foliate uh, patterns uh, on the soundboard. Perhaps the best preserved one that I've seen is in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. And it really is beautiful. These were beautiful instruments. The, um, the gilding is quite stunning. And, you know, we, we see them, oh, it's just an old harp today, you know. But imagine um, the decoration you know, in pristine condition, and this, uh, these gilt shamrocks at low light, candlelight, or maybe gaslight in a, in a drawing room, and hearing these silvery ter tones, the soundscape of Patrick Byrne, uh, and the flickering of these gold shamrocks, it was quite something, would have been quite something. Um, it's difficult to accurately assess the impact of Egan's improved Irish harp on uh, Ireland's harping tradition and the revival efforts. Although it did allow the canon of ancient harp music to be extended into the 19th century. And uh, these music teachers at the schools were a direct link to the Belfast Harp Festival of 1792. Mm -hmm. 
Egan's basic design was later uh, adapted uh, by the Drawhead Harp Society, you know, basically the same construction. And then there is also anecdotal evidence from Charlotte Milliken Fox in her 1912 <coughs> book that there were amateur ladies in Drogheda who studied harp with an old harper. Um, so there were other plays, it just hasn't been um, chronicled, you know, just, we just don't know um, who played these harps. So um, why devote years to the study of a 19th century Irish harp maker? I've often asked myself that <laughs> question. Um, I belong to this wonderful group in Boston. It's the Boston Biographers Group. They're like, they've been like my support group. And we, we meet once a month in Cambridge near Harvard. And I've just noticed amongst all the people there, they all, they all have different, completely different subjects. But there's this common goal to bring recognition to the life of another person who has either been overlooked in history or incorrectly represented in the historical record. Seems like a worthwhile thing to do. And as we know, John Egan's significant legacy is the portable Irish harp, uh, which was copied and really was the template for the modern Irish harp that's played today. Um, but also, these Belfast harps were important to this tradition, to the whole strand of Irish harp history. And I'm, I'm so pleased to finally um, chronicle these harps and recognize them um, in the book.